Good afternoon. I will now call uh, the meeting of Economic Development and Environment to order. My name is uh, Ron Bonatus, and I'm the MLA for the Dead Shore Riding and the Deputy Chair of the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. We are currently having a technical briefing on the review of royalty regulations and update on development of resources legislation in the NWT. I would like to remind all members and presenters to please pass all questions and comments to myself as the chair and please wait to be recognized before speaking as this will allow a smoother transition. I would also like to remind members that this is a technical briefing so no questions of a political nature are permitted. Please keep your questions technical in nature. Um, I will now have a committee introduce themselves, starting on my left. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Framelink. Tylan Johnson, Emily Friel, and Ipnoise. Nockleby, MLA Great Slave. Jane Whale and Armstrong, MLA for Murphy. Let's see. Um, I would like to remind staff and members that we have a hard stop at 12.45 today. I will now pass this over to the staff from ITI for opening remarks and to continue with their presentation. Let's see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Menzi McEachern, Assistant Deputy Minister of Mineral and Petroleum Resources with the Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment. I'm joined here uh, with two of my team members who I'll ask if they can please introduce themselves. Uh, everyone, back. good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Andy Lischinski, I'm the Director, Diamonds, Royalties and Financial Analysis at um, ITI. Good afternoon. Mr. Chair, my name is Hendrik Falk. I'm uh, the manager of uh, uh, geology and resource royalty policy at ITI. Your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Falk will be delivering our presentation today, and then we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions after that. So we have the opening slide here. I just wanted to sort of remind people of where we are in the process of developing a new and reviewing our current royalty regime. And uh, as you can see from the list here, we're uh, sort of in the middle stages, developing policy options uh, and looking at financial modeling of recommendations that we've heard to date. If we can go to the next slide just wanted to sort of remind you of some of the background work that we've gone through. We've uh, completed the tax and royalty benchmark report with PricewaterhouseCooper, which gave us sort of a picture of where we're at. Uh, we worked with the, um, the Intergovernmental Council Secretariat, which became the technical working group on a discussion paper. We provided a research paper, and most recently, we compiled together an engagement paper of all of the things that we heard from different parts of the NWT. Uh, next page. And so just a reminder from the discussion paper, which we presented to you some time ago now, um, there were three main questions that we felt needed to be addressed as part of the review. And the first one is, are the NWT royalty regulations providing a fair share of the profit? The second one is the NWT regulations contributing to a competitive investment environment in the NWT. And the third one is, is the utility of the royalty rec regulations really being maximized? And so these are, these are the focal points of our review, basically, and how we're going to test whether we're successful or doing the right things or not. And so I'll go through some of the things, the uh, process that we're looking to use to accomplish this. Next slide, please. So when we started this process, we'd heard a number of things through the uh, uh, engagement during the ACT development. Uh, we also had our own ideas and things we'd inherited from uh, the federal government as to things that should be changed with the royalty regulations. And then we went through the engagement process. Next slide. And that sort of gave us a new perspective on what people felt was needed for the NWT. And part of our 
uh, excitement about doing this process was to ensure that we developed a made in the north solution that we had really uh, something that was appropriate for the unique governance structure of the NWT here. Uh, next slide please. So at the end of the engagement and compiling all of the feedback that we heard basically, we had a number of new suggestions and different ideas that had been proposed to us that we wanted to investigate. And so I've categorized them here into three separate columns of uh, changes that we want to make. The first column, you'll notice the little icon on top, it's got the big bucks. It's, it's the real royalty structure, how it's calculated, how we actually set the values and the tiers. Uh, the second column has a still a substantial pile of coins there, but a somewhat smaller uh, sort of impact. And that's looking at deductions and allowances. Uh, things that are more incentive based and in trying to change behaviors of companies or adjust to make the NWT more competitive or less competitive. Those are the kind of tools that can be used there. And the third column are those elements that are more of an administrative nature. Still very important, important to get good definitions for good governance and so on, uh, but in terms of the impact and the total dollar figure of royalties in the NWT, less significant. So today we're just going to go through the elements of the first column, and this is uh, material that we've been working with the Indigenous governments at the working group with uh, on already, and so there's some, some ideas to be presented here. Uh, next slide, please. So in the What We Heard report, there were very polarized views of what the royalty system should look like going forward in the NWT. On the one hand, we, we have a, an option to uh, move to a more progressive royalty system with a higher rate in the range of 50% and a higher cap level. On the other hand, it was suggested that we're not competitive with the existing jurisdictions in Canada, and an, offer, and an example was offered of the 5% royalty that's set up in Northern Ontario as an incentive by the Ontario government. So, you know, how do mining companies view this? Well, they certainly see it as uh, more attractive in Northern Ontario than up here. Next slide, please. So, just as a primer here, when you look at calculating royalties, there's a number of different stages in the value chain where you can actually calculate uh, a royalty that are sort of commonly used around the world, basically. The, the first one can be on the physical ore, just weigh the ore and come up with a number. The second one is calculate the metal in that ore and determine a value of that. The third one is once some of the processing is done, the metal value is determined there and you calculate the royalty at that point or you get into the net operating or net proceeds level, which includes more of the operating costs. And finally, at the bottom, when you have all of the investment and capital and expenditures taken into account, you end up at the fifth option, which is what we currently use as our main royalty, a net profit uh, royalty. If we go to the next slide, please. So these different stages have different calculations associated with them, and as a consequence, you can look down the rate column here. You have $15 per ton on one uh, column there, and then below that, 4% for a, a gross value royalty, 6% for a net smelter revenue, or 10% for a net income. And all of these have exactly the same outcome of how much royalty is collected, over the life of a model mine here, and we're using a base metal mine here as an example. And this sort of shows you that the percentages that you get here, oh, they've got 5% here, they've got 10% here. You really have to understand what is the calculation being used, how is it being calculated to get the right uh, understanding of how that is impacting the project and what is the government take on this as well. Our next slide, please. So one of the things that we've identified from the What We Heard report and we've uh, identified previously was that uh, the uh, NWT would benefit from a minimum royalty and perhaps we should look at a hybrid regime, a hybrid regime having two different calculation points. One is a main profit-based one, but another 
royalty calculation that allows us to collect something at all times. And there's some advantages and disadvantages, and it depends on which of the, the calculation methods one chooses, how, how the advantages and disadvantages play out, basically. Now, the, the main advantage of a hybrid regime is it ensures that something is collected at all times. So if a company and a mine never makes a profit, there's still a royalty that's paid for the material that leaves the NWT. We get something no matter what happens. It can be collected on a more frequent basis as well. That's a possibility, um, depending on which calculation you choose. Uh, Profit-based, it's very difficult to collect on a regular interval. It has to be done more on an annual basis. On the disadvantage side, uh, you know the, the elements that most ad valorem or um, uh, uh, gross value based uh, royalties would have, uh, they, they impact how the operation is run, they can change how an operator makes their decisions, and so we have to be careful uh, to set the values at an appropriate level, not to influence how the operator runs an operation, but to allow them to maximize the resource in the ground, basically. So again, positives and negatives, depending on which one you choose and how you choose it, as well as where you set the values. Next slide, please. So just looking across Canada, there's a number of different uh, the ones with yellow ticks there are basically the ones that have a hybrid-based regime. Uh, different calculation points are used across the country. Uh, most of them default to an NSR level, uh, uh, sort of a net smelter return level, uh, although uh, BC and Quebec do use the net proceeds calculation for their uh, approach. And you can see the percentages range from 0.5 in Manitoba to about 2% for a net smelter return and 1 to up to 4% uh, in Quebec for the net proceeds. So if I can go to the next slide, please. So this is basically uh, looking at a minimum royalty and where we want to set it up. How, what level would we want to test in our financial modeling? Uh, and uh, these are sort of the main options that we want to examine as being sort of realistic values and seeing what the impacts on the profitability and competitiveness, as well as what the uh, level of return to the government would look like. Next slide, please. And so just a reminder, when you see 1% to 2%, it seems like a small number, but the entire royalty system uh, would be replaced by a net smelter return of 6%. So really, you, you're playing within a much smaller uh, set of numbers for a minimum royalty. Uh, next slide, please. So. That's, that's a decision point that we're looking at and trying to come up with the best answer in terms of how things could work in our territory. Uh, the next point is from some of the what we heard report is the progressive range of royalties should be stepped up more steeply. And what does that mean? So we'll, we'll go to the next slide, please. The concept of progressivity, basically, is that as a, a tax is placed on, on the taxable income, uh, as, as one gets richer, one should get taxed more, is, is the logic behind progressivity. So that uh, as the, the profitability of a project gets higher, the government take should increase as well. This is different than regressive taxes, such as ad valorem taxes or land rental fees and things like that, which uh, are often designed just to have a flat rate or a, a non-scaled rate particularly, so they, they hit everyone equally, but that means if you're not doing well, you're actually taxed more than someone who is uh, doing well. Next slide, please. So how does this play out in our current regulations? So this is literally a cut from the current regulations, which is we have a main rate of 13%, and if your royalties, you do the output of mine and you run your calculation through this table here, and you run it at 13%, and you choose the lesser of the two as the royalty that's paid. And so these tiers 
actually operate in the same fashion as if you do your income tax. If you're making more money, you start entering into the higher and higher brackets. However, the last time these tiers were looked at was 1995, so they're somewhat out of date. If we go to the next slide here. And when we look through our sort of economic analysis since 1995, we see that a dollar in 1995 is now worth a dollar 80, or, or will buy you a uh, dollar 80 is what will have bought a, uh, what you could have bought for a dollar in 1995. So really, we have to keep up with the times, and the tiers really haven't done that. So we do need to look at uh, changing those. If we go to the next slide. So what would that look like? Well, basically, the closest, sort of easiest solution is just literally doubling our tiers here. And so that basically would change those numbers to the numbers in purple. Uh, the rates would stay constant. And then we can look at what the implications of that decision are. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we sort of test? Are we getting our fair share and, you know, are we getting the right answers out of our decisions, basically? And for that purpose, we've worked with my, Dr. Michael Doggett, who runs Beach Meadow Resources uh, out of Vancouver. He's a mineral economist of uh, quite worldwide renown, as uh, one of the top mineral economists in Canada. And uh, he's helped us develop a financial model that looks at how a mine financially operates in the NWT. And we'll be using that to test, are we getting our fair share? And go to the next slide, please. Now, what, what does a royalty model look like? It, it's basically a picture of how money flows through a mining operation or a project, and you look at the expenditures versus the returns, the income, uh, and uh, use that to evaluate, is this a financially feasible project or not? Um, if for the NWT's model, we've designed uh, the, geolo the models that are sort of hiding behind it, the geological targets, to be realistic. So we're not looking at a giant coppery porphyry uh, deposit that would be appropriate in Peru. We're looking for something that we would actually find here. And then we've looked at the operating costs and the uh, capital expenses and compare those to historical production and our current uh, advanced projects to make sure that we're getting the right costs and the right uh, um, uh, infrastructure penalties that, that are imposed on our deposits here to be recognized in our financial model. We've developed also three models, really, one for a base metal model uh, base metal deposits of lead and zinc and some silver. We have one for diamond deposits and also a gold deposit. We can go to the next slide. And so this is sort of some of the numbers that are hiding behind the, uh, the, the financial model there. Uh, we're looking at a base metal mine that's fairly large. It's an underground operation with a 23-year mine life. You can see sort of the the uh, tons of, uh, millions of tons of zinc, lead, and silver in there, as well as some of the revenues and so on. And each of these numbers actually represents a whole series of calculations that are on the various spreadsheets behind, behind the scenes, basically. This is just a summary of things. Uh, the gold operation is a smaller gold operation. We wanted to test that as well. Uh, it switches from an open mine, open pit mine, to an underground mine during its life and uh, has a much shorter mine life. Uh, it's a small operation, but it is sort of quite geologically feasible of what we would see in the territory here, uh, as well as a reasonably good diamond mine, not extraordinary, but but likely to go ahead level of mine. And that's, that's important for us to recognize that these are mines, if we found them in reality, these would be likely to go into operation, basically. Uh, often one wants to choose a mine that's sort of marginal, and then you end up with fairly unrealistic uh, scenarios coming out of that kind of model. Uh, we chose ours to be fairly re realistic. Uh, go ahead, please. So that's what an output page looks like. You get a lot of numbers out of it. Uh, and. Basically, uh, a key element to this royalty modeling is it not only models the royalties, 
but it puts the entire tax package that an operation would face here in the territories uh, into a complete picture. So we're calculating what's known as the average effective tax rate for each of these models. Uh, and that's important because uh, the taxes and royalties are actually interrelated. If you increase royalties, you'll actually start decreasing your taxes uh, and vice versa. If you decrease royalties, some of the taxes actually increase. So understanding that balance really allows us to understand how it's going to change in our competitive position. Now it's also good to know that this model is not meant to be used for forecasting royalties, but it's just an, a tool for policy option development, allowing to us to assess how the uh, options we're developing will impact the regime. Uh, next slide, please. So here's, a, here's an example of, of some of the outcomes. In the middle column, basically, we have our current status quo. That's what we get right now. Uh, royalties and how they're represented in the base metal mine under one pricing scenario which is called the base case. And uh, these are sort of the three, I would say, critical metrics that we use to evaluate our sex success or failure. On the corporate side, there's the post-tax MPV, the net present value. Uh, the 8 represents that it's a, at a discount rate of 8%. And then the post-tax uh, internal rate of return, or IRR. Uh, these are two metrics that are very commonly used by interest, uh, by industry to say, is this a good project or a bad project? And it's, a, it's sort of a well-known shorthand. At the bottom, on the other hand, we have our AETR, our average effective tax rate. Now, it's a, this is how much tax over the life of the entire project is collected by all of the governments. And so it it's represents basically the tax take from a project. It's important to recognize that an AETR is model specific. So it only works for this model. If you see other models, you can't compare the AETR directly from one model to another necessarily. Uh, but it is, a, it is a quite a widely used tool to measure how competitive uh, governments are against each other. Now, just to illustrate, we have two other columns there. On the right side, we have what happens if we use the uh, uh, example offered for Ontario, a 5% royalty. And we can see that the government take goes from 34% of the uh, project value there to 29%. Uh, the company value increases from 822 million to 898 million, and the metrics for the in internal re rate of review, our rate of return, change from 20.2 to 20.8. So not a dramatic jump in your internal re rate of return, but a fairly large jump in the amount of money and the AETR. And that sort of gives you an illustration of how sensitive the different metrics really are for um, change, basically. And uh, the opposite one is we've taken the suggestions for the uh, increased tiers uh, up to the uh, maximum rate of 50% and a $200 million cap and modeled that. And that provides us with a 44% AETR. Uh, it drops the IRR down to 18.9% and the government take uh, or the, the company take is down to 676 million. So this is the kind of numbers we will have for making decisions between good and bad. And I just wanted to give you a feel for how, how they look basically here. Next slide, please. So our second question is, are we, are we getting, contributing to a stable and competitive investment environment? So we want to make our changes, but how does this really impact uh, where we fall in terms of other jurisdictions? So to do that, we actually use a different tool. And I'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, the tool we've used in the past, we've got, had the Price Waterhouse Coopers people do a comparative review. They've shown us where we fall in comparison to a series of other jurisdictions, both in Canada and internationally. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, fortunately, Natural Resources Canada has also been conducting a similar review, but they're using slightly different models and metrics. So we wanted to look at how we fall in their survey as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
And really, the results that we receive from Natural Resources Canada is quite similar to what we saw coming from PricewaterhouseCoopers. We fall sort of on the lower end of the median of Canadian jurisdictions, and the median of, uh, uh, we're a little bit below the median of all of the companies, uh, our con countries and jurisdictions surveyed. So that's basically the same position as we discovered with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there's more information in their study as well on how we compare, uh, but this slide is quite interesting where we look at the ATR. And just to sort of provide some perspective, I've added in the 5% option and the 50% option on the left and right hand, uh, sides of the slide to show you that Changing to a 5% would definitely move the NWT to the left hand. We would be more competitive than Saskatchewan. And changing to a 50% regime would move us more to the right side of the graph, and we would be less competitive than New Brunswick in, in comparison to other jurisdictions in Canada. Next slide, please. So that's basically how we're going to assess this sort of option in terms of financial modeling. Uh, once we have our choices settled uh, to a, a, a good degree, uh, we've uh, been able to um, get NRCAN to volunteer to rerun their model as well, and we'll be able to test how we are competitively as well, which was a real good advantage in terms of having a comfort level of how, how good our decisions really are. Uh, next slide. But I wanted to show this one as our sort of next part of the project, basically, which is looking at how we're going to change some of our uh, deductions and allowances. There, through the What We Heard report, we had a number of different topics raised, both by industry and the public. I've added the different topics in red here, uh, as well as the ones that we kind of started with. And uh, these are areas that we're currently researching, looking at other jurisdictions and how they handle these uh, deductions and allowances, uh, as well as looking at what are the implications. And once we have sort of the, the tax or the royalty calculation uh, comfortably in hand, it'll be possible to us to better evaluate how these different allowances and deductions will impact that, uh, and then allow us to move to a more um, uh, policy option decision making level at the next stage. So that's currently where we are and I, I welcome any questions you might have. The uh, next slide is just asking for questions uh, and thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Merci uh, Mr. Falk for your presentation. Um, I will now pass, uh, I will now open the floor for a committee for questions. Any questions from committee? Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, can someone just give me a sense? I, I, so I believe the current royalty regime, the highest you can get is 14% on uh, income before tax. Or So first, someone clarify what it is, and then uh, who and, and whether anyone is actually paying that, like how often you actually get above, uh, I think it's 35 million or 45 million. Uh, I hope that's a clear question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, must see Mr. Johnson. Uh, oh, Mr. Menzi. It's a, it's <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I'll uh, ask uh, Mr. Falk to uh, to answer that question for us. But um, <clears throat> should uh, start off by noting that in terms of who is paying uh, at what percentage at any given uh, time in the, in the sort of operating life of mine is still subject to our uh, confidentiality um, requirements through our uh, legislation and regulations. But over to Mr. Falk to uh, speak to the uh, sort of uh, 13 to 14 percent tier and, and how that works on the pro progressivity scale. Basically, oh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the uh, 
Uh, currently, we're finding that even looking at sort of advanced projects and what we're, what are being proposed, we would find most of them go through the tiers in a fairly early part of their their lifespan, and so they're they're not performing the function that they were designed to perform. They they should be impacting the mine much further into its lifespan, and that's one of the reasons we feel that uh, both the the, the size of the tiers, the top of the tiers, needs to be adjusted to sort of current dollars. It, it's no longer performing the policy function that it was designed to do. Must put that uh, follow up, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just so I understand, so it, it, we we have mines who are paying the fourteen percent. There's people who are making more than forty-five million dollars in general. Okay. <laughs> Profit before tax. Just wanted to clarify that. Uh, and then, so the thought is, you get it to ninety. In theory, there's might be some mines up there. Okay, okay. Um, but I guess my next question, if we could go back to the the second to last slide, uh, th there's a list of potential deductions and additions there. So I I, I, I just want to clarify: Have any of those decisions been made? Are we are we go for sure going ahead with some, and are for sure not removing some or anything? There was a red and black. And then there was two columns. I didn't quite understand what that meant in regards to decisions. Thank you. Uh, what page was that? Uh, 31, slide 31. Slide 31. Uh, Mr. McEachern. Yeah, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yeah, so the no, no decisions have been made regarding the deductions and allowances at this point. <clears throat> this is simply a list of those deductions and allowances that we will analyze. And it's, the list is uh, a combination of ones we had originally thought of and based on, say, for example, things we've seen in other jurisdictions. And what you see in red is actually a result of our um, public engagement process. Uh, and these are ideas for deductions and allowances that uh, various uh, stakeholders or parties have, have suggested that we look at. And so we're certainly happy to do that you know, a good example would be socioeconomic agreements, benefit agreements, if companies have those in place, should that result in some sort of deduction or allowance, uh, you know, looking at property taxes. That's, you know, something we've heard from industry is, you know, repeatedly, you know, they have to pay property tax in the NWT, even if they're, you know, hundreds of kilometers away from any sort of uh, services that other people would um, benefit from if they're actually located in a city or in, in a town. Um, so a couple of examples there and then of course uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, compliance. If they're doing well from an emissions perspective, do, should, should they get rewarded uh, if, you know, if they're investing in renewable energy technologies for example. Um, northern procurement and contracting performance if they're doing a great job uh, in that perspective should they get some sort of consideration there. So just some examples um, and, and uh, you know, I think these are, we agree that these are all ideas worth uh, looking at and analyzing and how they might impact the, both the feasibility of, of mining projects as well as what we would take uh, on the government side of things. And we do of course know that that royalties uh, are just one of um, many benefits that we see from uh, from our mining projects in the territory. You know, jobs being a huge one. Um, you know, northern business benefits being a huge one. Training, etc. So, royalties is just one part of the picture, and in fact, just one part of the overall fiscal or tax picture. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's see for that answer. Um, if you have any further questions, Mr. Johnson, we'll put you back on the list. Uh, Ms. Nopoli. Uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I'm glad to see that we're modeling numbers and we're able to play with it and use it, and I believe this is going to be a great tool uh, helping us to go forward. So one uh, clarification or, or correction on one of your slides is the one where you talk about reclamation. Um, I think it was uh, slide 21. You, the reclamation piece should actually overlap. Uh, the production piece of the mine, not start at the end. There is progressive reclamation that goes on, and as we continue to talk about the remediation economy, I think we need to be realistic about how much uh, time that actually is after the life of the mine. So 
Uh, yes, that's it there on the screen now. So thank you for that. That's just a comment. Uh, my first question is, will this uh, uh, modeling uh, be available to explorers to help them make determinations around whether or not they're going to proceed with mines, given the certain different criteria or, or tax regime that the GNWT may uh, propose? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. I see Ms. Nockaby, uh, Mr. McEachern. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we definitely are, are uh, living in a welcome time of increased transparency. And uh, so, you know, we anticipate that once after, um, you know, after our modeling work and has been verified by a third party uh, evaluator as, yep, getting the stamp of that sort of uh, third party approval. Um, then you know we would make our our model uh, public, and that could be you know um, used by anyone with clearly with with the expertise and and uh, the I guess the the desire to to do so. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely something on the horizon that we anticipate um, having that tool available uh, publicly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's see, uh, Ms. Nockerby. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. I completely agree that verification of the model obviously is needed, and I hope that's coming soon. I don't want to waste my question on asking when. Uh, so my next question is, currently I think the feds take 50% of the royalties. Will that be still the case when we move forward with a new regime? Thank you. Let's see, Ms. Nockerby, uh, Mr. McEachern. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, I mean, um, that, I would say simply is out of scope for our work, and that's that's more of a, <clears throat> a political and policy uh, subject that uh, you know between the GNWT and and Canada and Indigenous governments that you know that if they if there was an interest uh, that those parties could open up that uh, conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll see for catching that. Um. <laughs> um, Mr. O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I got about 20 questions, and unfortunately, there's four minutes left, so I think we're going to need to have our guests come back. But no, I appreciate this. It's given me some uh, good insights into where you're going with the modeling. Um, I guess um, my my first question is, uh, I think it's on slide five, um, and I believe. Uh, Mr. McEachern mentioned this as well about transparency. So I don't see anything in the whole presentation, though, about transparency. Uh, is that another step or something separate? Uh, when is there going to be some discussion or proposals put forward around transparency? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I see Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. McEachern. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, transparency is definitely a sort of um, policy area um, that is in scope for the, the royalty review. However, it's not um, ne necessary to include it in the modeling. Uh, this is more about, the modeling is more about the, you know, the royalty structure, rates, uh, you know, different incentives or tools. We spoke to the deductions and allowances. Um, so the transparency is another sort of policy theme uh, if we can call it that, that um, you know, we'll continue working with our indigenous government partners uh, at the technical working group to develop uh, you know options around transparency, uh, and then it'll simply be subject, just like the rest of the regula uh, regulation policy areas, to the uh, intergovernmental uh, uh, council co-development protocol that we have. Um, at work here across multiple lands and natural resources legislation and regulation projects. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll see for that, uh, Mr. Riley. Yeah, okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, when does the, the public get a say in any of this? You folks have already kind of defined the three uh, kind of principles by which this is going to be uh, Answering you know, and those are here on, on slide number four um, And I've got lots of questions around these you know, like who defines what's fair is it fair for the government in terms of the government take is it fair for the uh, um, You know uh, mining company uh, Who's who's it supposed to be fair for but 
I guess my real question, Mr. Chair, is when does the public get another say in any of this? Is the public going to have a, an opportunity to express views or uh, suggest models or... Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. We'll start with that. Thank you. Let's see, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, Mr. McEachern. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we intend to, uh, yes, release the sort of draft uh, royalty uh, policies. Um, uh, likely, uh, you know, we're perhaps uh, we need to be cognizant of the uh, of the incoming government. Uh, you know, the the, ele the election coming up uh, in the fall. And we have to, you know, so our, our work with the technical working group, it kind of depends on what stage we're at at that point. But we anticipate uh, later in the fall being able to come out publicly with where we're at in terms of, of the draft policies, which would then uh, lead um, after that into the drafting process. Uh, so drafting of uh, regulations and then subject to a number of other formal sort of uh, process steps that we've probably or you have probably heard quite a bit about with with other lands and natural resources uh, legislative projects um, such as um, subject to step G in, in the legislative co-development pro protocol aboriginal con consultation and and then formal public posting of the royalty regulations um, before the, they can come into force. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see Mr. McEachern and committee. I apologize uh, our time. Our time for this portion uh, has come to an end. We're having a hard stop at 12.45 as there's another function happening uh, downstairs. Um, I think the staff will work with the minister's office to look at another time to conclude this meeting if committee desires. Um, with that, I would like to thank staff of ITI for the presentation on the review of royalty regulations. So I will now conclude the public portion of this meeting. Committee, can I have a motion to move in camera? Ms. Knuckleby? Let's see. We are now in camera. We'll take a five minute break. Let's